Smartcast. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. There's a change happening in the way we live, the way we work, the way we spend our money and make our decisions. We are evolving to be more conscious in our actions in a way that serves the world and makes it a better place. Welcome to The Ethical Evolution. The Ethical Evolution podcast is brought to you by Ethical Change Agency. I'm Bindi, I'm the founder, and my mission is to help ethical entrepreneurs and holistic healers to find their voice through spiritual coaching and podcasting. I'm honoured to bring you the stories of those who create change through healing, kindness, innovation, purpose, and spirit. Understanding that to create collective change, we need to be the change. It all begins with us. Lynn Bowman is the glam granny that knows how to get you to eat your veggies. There is enormous power in resetting your relationship with food, taking control of your health, strength, mindset and mood. But why take cooking or health advice from a snarky grandma who isn't a reality TV star or a doctor and doesn't particularly like to cook? Here's why. Diagnosed more than 30 years ago, Lynn is living proof that you can cook, eat, sleep, laugh and walk your way out of type 2 diabetes, along with other chronic ailments, just like in her latest book, Brownies for Breakfast, a cookbook for diabetics and the people who love them. With a background as an award-winning creative director, advertising manager, actress, makeup artist, screenwriter, illustrator and TV weather person, Lynn has so much wisdom and laughs to share and is the granny we all need in our lives. Welcome, Lynn, to The Ethical Evolution. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be with you from so very far away, 17 hours away. What a blast, (laughs) right? Now, Lynn, um, I'm so excited to spend some time with you today. Can you tell us who you are and what you do? No. (laughs) (laughs) I have no idea who I am. I'm too old, Lynn. I, I'll start with that. I'm old. I'm 76. And so that colors a lot of what I say. Get um, out of town. Things. Get out. No, no I'm not going to get out of town. <laughs> I, I, and I'm old and mean. And, and that's, that's my main calling card. Uh, and, and I'm a grandma. So I know stuff, mm. right? Because mm-hmm. that's what we know stuff. <clears throat> I can also say I'm a recovering marketing person <laughs> after I had a having had a long career in advertising and marketing and um, writing things. Uh, this I just uh, published my fourth book, and it is about food, as you know. It's called Brownies for Breakfast, mm. a cook for diabetics and the people who love them. So I hope we'll talk a little bit about what that means for folks, because it has to do with ethics in mm. a good way. Yeah. And uh, so I don't know. What else do I need to tell you? I'm <laughs> California. Uh, I've lived in lots of places. I live in the country now with uh, owls and foxes and lions and um, all kinds of wonderful human wildlife and animal wildlife. Uh, so, yeah. And because I'm old, I get uh, I kind of do what I want, which is so cool. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, um, you know, those who can't see you at the moment, you're, you're in your beautiful home and, I, and in the background I'm seeing your dog walk back and forth and, and the lovely acreage that you're on. So, um, yeah, um, very grateful to be a part of your space today. But um, so tell us about um, why food? You know, I don't have a great answer for that. <clears throat> I think I always love to eat. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't, right? <laughs> yeah. There are people who really don't seem to care that much. As like, you know, and I won't mention people currently in politics, for example, in my country, 
But there are people who seem to be okay with just shoveling down fast food all mm. the time and soft drinks all the time. So, but, but I always love to eat and I never had any money or time. So I, I knew the only way I was going to be able to, to eat well was either go out with somebody that I didn't particularly want to go out with half the time, <laughs> or, which, and that, you know, that was back in the day, mm. right? When we did that kind of thing. Um, or I would have to cook, make it myself, source the food. Mm. And I also realized that that was a great way to have a social life is to be the one who had a meal on the table because it was very easy always to have the gathering at my house and mm. they would bring the wine and the, you know, whatever. And then I would make the, the spaghetti or whatever. And it was, it was a way to survive. It was a way to eat decently, to cook. And, uh, and nobody else seemed to be doing it. So, and that evolved into having a bunch of kids and then being the single mother of three and then being their source uh, income uh, the only source of income for them. So that meant I was working my tail off, you know, and, and so if you you had to make it fast, it had to be cheap and it had to be healthy. Mm. And, and I also wanted it to be nice. I, I wanted it to be at the table with napkins and plates and that that always mattered to me and I wanted it to matter to my kids. So and my friends seemed to appreciate the candles and the napkins and so on. So so that it just evolved over years. And then as time went on, I realized that it really so many people hadn't learned those things. Mm. They didn't know how to put a meal on the table and they didn't know what needed to go along with the food on the table. And so I began writing some stuff about that time went on and uh and my kids finally said to me you know you got to write this stuff down you have to write about this stuff really yeah you have to write about it so I did and as part of that I had discovered in my 40s Bindi that I was diabetic wow so and a lot of people don't <laughs> know until later on in their lives that they have diabetes type 2 diabetes but I, I learned fairly early and I had lost my mother when I was 18. She died of a chronic disease. So I had this kind of dual influence of wanting to live. Mm -hmm. I want to stay alive for my children. And my mother's death was no fault of hers. But diabetes is one of those things that you have a certain amount of control yeah. over. You have actually a great deal of control over it. And, and I... I'm happy to say at this point, I'm out of diabetic range. I am not technically diabetic. After decades of the medical establishment saying to me, oh no, it's a progressive disease. No, you just, you know, you do the best you can, you lose weight and you said, you know, well, bullshit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do I get to say that? I'm a granny. Indeed you do. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. And I want every, I want the whole world to know that diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and lots of other chronic diseases are absolutely reversible. Mm. If you didn't know that, you heard it from me just now, and it is true. And the, the cool thing is how do you reverse that? With wonderful food, mm. with the best food you've ever eaten in many cases, with much better food than you're eating now, quite likely. Mm. People all associate diabetes with, oh, you have to give up this and you can't eat any sugar and you can't eat sweets and you can't eat, you know, no, 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 no. You have to do what everybody actually should be doing, both for their health and to eat ethically. Mm -hmm. mm. And, and Lynn, there's so much to unpack there. Um, but first of oh. all, I, I, I want to say um, <clears throat> you are the youngest looking 76 year old I've ever seen. Can I just say? Um, I love back up like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is no way you look your age, can I just say? And I would say that that has a lot to do with your diet and your lifestyle, um, which yeah. is probably something that you and I have in common is that a lot of people don't believe how old I am. I'm almost 50. Um, and <laughs> my, 
people go, no, you're about 30. Um, um, yeah, no. Um, but because, um, you know, we choose food that is right for us, that is not overly processed, that, you know, your great grandmother would have recognized, um, and that is ethically sourced, um, it actually impacts how you feel on the inside and the outside. It's all connected, mm-hmm. all of it, connected, which is also so interesting. And uh, uh, also, just to be absolutely frank here, there's a great filter on this system. <laughs> I got no so, filter. <laughs> I have a filter on, so. You know. You're still fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. And also, and I confessed to you earlier that I was actually born in Hollywood mm. of all the weird places to be born. So um, I, I spent a lot of my life standing in front of a mirror next to the most beautiful women in the world. Mm. I mean, I was the kind of plain little brunette that was too short and too dark. And so I, you know, all these beautiful, tall, blonde women. So, so I learned some tricks of the trade believe me. <laughs> in, the, in the dressing rooms back in the day. Mm. Um, and, uh, and it just sort of stays with you as, it, you know, maybe a ridiculous standard for, you know, we, come on, we don't care that much, right? Anymore. Mm. Um, but, but growing up with that, and being in the business that I was in, uh, it was a lot about, the costume, mm. you know, mm. all about showing up, looking a certain way um, and in the business. And, and I did most of my career in the Silicon Valley. Mm. So I was the only girl in the room a lot. Mm. It was the it was the nerdy boys and me, you know. <laughs> um, so so you, you, you have to sort of uh, play the game, as it were. Mm. But food, yes. food, let's talk about food. And it's also, it's not strictly food, it's moving. Mm-hmm. You have to move, absolutely. And as I pointed out to you, I, I missed my nap for you today. <laughs> oh, which I'm so grateful for. It'll be worth it, trust me. It's about sleep. Mm. And we are just now in the last decade, I think, there's lots of information coming out about how deeply interconnected sleep and food. Mm. You understand that that how you sleep affects your appetite. It affects what you eat, and how that food is processed, and and how you eat affects how you sleep. And this was a big one that maybe everybody knows now, but I didn't know until fairly recently. That the only time your body actually heals is in deep sleep. Mm. Mm, absolutely. So, mm. You know, but every time that one really sinks in for me, uh, I think about all those years <laughs> right? I'm doing terrible damage to myself with Red Mountain wine and, you know, Marlboro cigarettes and all the things that we did back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, but if you're going to heal from anything, you have to sleep. Mm. And in order to deeply and well you have to eat for sleep who knew and you have to stop eating for sleep Mm. this is a fairly recent one too again i'm not making this up it's out there a lot of people are talking about it with better credentials than i have but you need to stop eating at least three or four hours before you sleep yep you know yes and, and I, I talk about it all the time because I'm amazed at how many people that I have conversations with who don't know that. Mm. And we, especially probably in Australia too, but in the United States, the habit is, you know, it's you and Jimmy Kimmel, the late show and a pizza in front of the TV. Mm. You know, you've been too busy all day and you're craving, you're tired and everything. And finally... At eight, nine o'clock at night, you go, oh, I'm really hungry. And you eat something cruddy and that you just microwave in front of the TV. And then you fall asleep in front of the TV. Is this a familiar scenario? Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's one of the worst things you can do for yourself. And and it, it causes weight gain and it causes gastric distress and all kinds of problems. Because 
your body has work to do at night. Mm. Look, have you talked about autophagy at all on this show? No. Well, it's one of my favorite new vocabulary words. Okay. <laughs> autophagy. And literally, it means eating yourself. Mm. And what it is, is the process that your cells undergo when you stop shoveling food down. And it takes 16 to 18 hours of no food for this to kick in. But then it's like the road crew on the highway. Once everybody's gone, out come the shovels and the brooms and the stuff, and they're cleaning. And your cells are doing, they're programmed to do exactly the same thing all over your body. They're getting rid of the stuff that has to go. They're eating up the stuff that they can reuse and repurpose. Isn't that weird? Mm. <laughs> I learned that. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, they are eating the crud or getting rid of the crud so that it doesn't pile up like your hall closet. It's going to, it's got to go. And then when it does go, all these other good things happen in your body. But if you don't leave that time for this autophagy, I'm dropping it again. I love that. <laughs> if you don't leave time for that to take place, it can't take place. So it's like your hall closet. It just piles up. Mm -hmm. And in, which is, I mean, you know, think about it. There's all kinds of icky stuff that happens. Yeah. Uh, you haven't allowed your system to be clean. So when people talk about time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting, that's what it is. It's mm. not you loincloth in a, you know, cave for six weeks. It's just leave a few hours, mm. <laughs> you know. Stop for a little while. And then what you find is that you actually feel better yep. when you don't eat. Are you experimenting with this? Have you kind of gotten into a rhythm of doing this? I have, yeah. Um, I've I've actually in the last few years done a lot of work with metabolic balance. I don't know if you've heard of it, um, <clears throat> but it has eight principles. And one of those principles is that you don't eat after 9 p.m. at night um, and that you have no more Canoe, four in the afternoon. Yeah, well, uh, this one you only have three uh, three meals a day um, and they must be within um, I think it's six hours of each other um, and that you must eat an apple a day. You must drink, you know, so much water per grams of weight that you have um, and, and sleep obviously was another one um, and that you have different proteins every day. So instead of having the same thing for lunch and dinner, uh, you, you have three different proteins at least in a day and you don't mix your proteins and it's the first bite of food that you have. I'm not such a hard ass. <laughs> it sounds pretty militant, but once you get into the rhythm of it, it actually does work really, really well. Based on stuff. And I think we also have to choose what suits our personality. Mm. I'm someone who does not like to be told. Mm. how many grams of this and what, you know, but, but so, so my recommendations are always really simple and I think relatively easy grandma like uh, to incorporate. And, but I don't eat after three, four in the afternoon. Wow. But as we've already discussed, I'm old. So, it, you know, a little bit different. I mean, you stop requiring as much mm. food. Mm. Uh, you really do eat less the older you get. Uh, or should, um, but it, but your appetite is different, mm. and so I don't eat in the evening at all. Yeah, and but then I'm asleep at nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm gone. Uh, and are you so are you noticing as well? You know, as uh, the older we get, that um, you listen to your body more. So you're actually listening to what's going on rather than going, what, what's happening here? You actually got that intuition of knowing what's going on and what you should and shouldn't put in it. Absolutely. And you need to listen. And one of the other joys about being this age is that after listening to everybody else for all these years, finally, some days you wake up and go, it's just me. Mm-hmm. Right? What's that sound? Nothing. I don't have to listen to anybody today but me. And 
it's it's wonderful and crazy, uh, you know, but it, it's a good feeling. And um, and I think particularly us female folks, you know, really kind of go over the edge when it comes to letting everyone else's needs and requirements, you know, our parents, our friend, whatever, mm-hmm. come before us. So, and I, I don't want to completely get away from the ethical part of this because I know that's important to you and to me too. Mm. And the fascinating thing is that the better you treat your own guts, the better you're treating the earth, the animals, the supply chain. I mean, the list goes on because what you find, and I'm a food nerd, so I've done a lot of reading in all kinds of ways about food distribution and food manufacturing and so on. And one of the horrible things that you figure out pretty quickly in these studies is that there are buildings full of people in New Jersey, let's just say, because it's far away and I don't know anyone almost, (laughs) one person, but truly along the highway in New Jersey, whose job it is to engineer food for craveability. Mm. And they, their whole life is about making sure you keep eating that food, whatever it is. Mm. It has nothing to do with you getting any health benefit out of that food or being blessed in any way by that food. It has only to do with shareholder value. Mm. That food is engineered from start to finish, starting how it's grown. And, you know, they don't care what kind of poison. They don't care what kind of factory farming, whatever. They just want a product that has been tested in the lab and designed so that you can stop eating it. And what that usually means is it's, of course, overprocessed. It's full of sugar and bad fats and extra salt and all these things, bad things. Uh, and then on the label, it says healthy snack. You can't stop eating it. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, it's true. <laughs> and it is addictive. And sugar is addictive. And these foods are, in the true sense, not metaphorical, but in the true sense of the word, they are addictive. Mm. So, where are the ethics in that? Mm. Say, to begin with, and particularly because these foods are, in large part, marketed to your kids mm. from the time they're tiny from the time they can stand on their little wobbly legs in front of the screen or sit in front of their new, their iPad. Mm. <laughs> Watch. <laughs> now they're seeing it in another way. And then you go in the market and you look on the lower shelves where the kids can reach and mm. guess what's there. Yeah. Hi kid. Mm. Uh, we're credible. You can't just eat one. And that's right. Um, so there, so there's that part of the ethical dilemma, let's say. Yeah. And, you know, I think coming back to, you know, what you were saying earlier as well, Lynn, you know, like that art of cooking at home, um, which basically removes a lot of that processed stuff, um, that, that art has pretty much died, hasn't it? Like if you look at people today, um, they're living such a fast lifestyle. They don't, half of them don't even know how to cook. Um, and if they do, it is processed stuff they're reheating. Um, but to actually create something from scratch and actually put love into it with, with fresh ingredients, like they just don't know how to do it anymore. Even shopping for groceries, they don't know how to do it anymore. To be fair, I get it. I, again, I was a single mom. I had a bunch of kids. And when you pile on top of that, what we ask of ourselves online and uh, you know, and the school wants this and that, and the mm. people's lives have become crazier and crazier. And what went out of the wagon was food and mm. cooking. Mm. Because you could get fast food, you could get grab and go, and and that just became the habit. Mm. And I, our kids, there are families where there are two generations of kids who've never eaten with utensils, and I'm not making this up, and I'm mm. not exaggerating. They have eaten out of bags and boxes with their hands. 
They've never sat at a table with utensils, with napkins, and had a meal. And so here is little Courtney and little Bobby being hauled to choir practice and football and all these things. And I am here today representing grandmas everywhere to say to you, is that more important than knowing how to be with other people at a table? Mm. Is it more important to go to that second choir practice? And I love music, but if you're sending your kid off to school or off to a career and they don't know how to have a conversation or how to use a napkin or a fork, I am willing to say that you have abused that child, that Mm. you have not taught that child what they need to know to function in the world. Do you really want them to show up at the dorm and look around and go, holy cow, what are they doing with those plates and things? Mm. And then there's that flow and effect as well, Lynn, you know, like um, if that's all they're eating, when they do need to perform, um, whether it be sport, music, anything, this is where we're starting to get those sort of things like ADHD or, you know, they just can't focus um, or they get health problems. Are horrible. I mean, we used to call it adult onset diabetes. Mm. It's not just type 2 diabetes because lots of kids are now being diagnosed Mm. with it. You know this. It's. Mm. I mean, the obesity statistics are horrible. And it isn't just obesity. It's all of the things that come with obesity and, you know, involving veins and hearts and livers and fatty liver. 30% of the people of the United States are estimated to now have fatty liver. Wow. That's a lot. 30%. That is a lot. (laughs) And so, yeah, you, you don't perform if your body is suffering Mm. like and kids it's harder for them to say you know i think i'm feeling some things in my mind they don't know any different it's normal for them Mm. so so it gets overlooked in many cases Mm. and um and with adults as well and of course guys are notorious for not going in and getting their blood work and being checked and so on most women have wound up, you know, with their legs in the stirrups and, you know, being looked at and poked and examined as a, a, a matter of course. But so many men are shocked to find in their 50s or 60s that they have been diabetic for years. Mm. And diabetes is a silent killer. So the longer you go without knowing that you have it, um, the more severe your your effects are going to be and those effects wind up being having your limbs removed Mm. you know this i'm sure um you you lose the ability to function in your extremities and all of your extremities by Mm. the way um you men particularly (laughs) and um, and you get you you go in for amputations yeah and that was a, a a big reason why sat my rear end in a chair for three years and did this book because the answer is not complicated Mm. and it's not medication. It's not um, surgery. It's don't eat crap. Yeah. There you go. And, you know, food is medicine instead of taking pills. Um, I'm I'm going to guess that you don't take a whole lot of pills. Am I right, Lynn? You're right. Yeah. So looking at our diet and how you can reverse type 2 diabetes, it can be done quite simply if you stick to it, right? You have to be persistent. Mm. Uh, You have to make a decision like anything else in life. It goes back to making a decision that you're going to do it and you're going to stay with it. And, And in my, again, my case, I was very motivated because I wanted to live. I I had three little ones that I wasn't about to leave. And, and I also wanted to be strong enough to, to do what I needed to do to support them. Mm. So, so that was a big motivator for me. And I don't know what yours would be. Um, and anyone listening, I, you have to find it. It's, it usually comes down to, do I want to be 
dependent on people. Do I want to, and here's a big one. Here's a big one. Do I want to spend all my money and a lot of money I don't have in a healthcare system that doesn't care about me because I will have to have surgeries, medication, all this stuff that will cost me a fortune. And in the US, 85% of the bankruptcies are health related. Mm. And the, by far the largest number of those are chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes. And the, the recipe is the same for almost any chronic disease you can come up with. It's whole food, plant-based food, sleep, mm -hmm. movement, uh, and what? Not too much mm. food. Once you start eating real food, that's the other part of it, whole food, plant-based food, you can't eat too much. Mm. Your body goes, hey, we're done, thanks, <clears throat> finished. As opposed to the craveability folks who have designed the food that you've been eating so that you can't stop eating it. When you sit down to a rainbow of vegetables and fruits, and and I I was vegan for a while, Bindi experimented with it. My numbers came down great. Mm. It was very good for me. And But now I found that it, it works if every once in a while, today, in fact, I did. I ate some grass-fed beef that was raised down the street from me. Mm -hmm. Literally, I know the cows to wave at them. And um, I ate a small amount of it on a big mound of vegetables and a beautiful mm. steak. It's really good. Uh, and that's like every couple months I'll yeah. have, but that's enough. Mm. That's all it did. And, and people are so shocked that you don't crave meat, you know, hamburgers. It's so stuff. true. It's so true. Like I found the same thing once I went on to, you know, that kind of diet, you don't crave the other stuff. And you also, if you do stray away from it and, and have a treat, um, sometimes it can make you immediately sick. Um, so your body I, reacts. As long mm. as you're eating, you're not straying <clears throat> off into, you know, barbecued ribs in some, no. you know, <laughs> In your restaurant, right? If you stay with with pretty healthy options, mm. I haven't had any horrible reactions yet. But the surprise, I mean, I was a huge meat eater because we were told as diabetics, eat vegetables and protein, no carbs, you know, stay mm. away from the carb. That's crazy. I can't believe how many artichokes I missed out on <laughs> all those years because they were a starchy vegetable. Mm. Please, mm. you know. Um. But I do eat some shrimp every once in a while. I will have some salmon, mm. you know, not often. And, and that I do kind of crave once in a while. Yeah. Fish. But, I, and at first, when I first really went vegan, I started eating some impossible burgery kinds of things. And they're great transitional foods. But I've been surprised too that I just don't yeah. want them Yeah. Anymore. Uh, once you start down the beautiful uh, garden path of of gorgeous vegetables and fruits, and the thing is, most people have been deprived of them mm. their whole lives because mm. they were too busy eating white bread and meat. So there was no time or space for the artichokes or for the uh, rainbow radishes mm. and watermelon radishes or or uh, these foods that you go, how did I not know how wonderful these were? Mm. Um, yeah, there's it's amazing, a lot of isn't it? Yeah, out there. So tell us, of course, a, I'm in, yeah, so <laughs> right. So tell us, <laughs> <I'm> a, <growing. laughs> tell us about um, brownies for breakfast. I will tell you about brownies for breakfast. The, the title people always ask me about because they haven't opened the book up yet. I hope you will. Uh, it's brownies that are made of such good food that you could eat them three meals a day and you would be healthy because they're made from real cocoa, just chocolate, mm -hmm. pumpkin, which I know you in Australia love as much as we do here in California, uh, and uh, cinnamon, an egg or egg substitute. Um, what am I forgetting? 
uh, uh, that's mostly it. Yeah. And the secret is, oh, you know, something to some sweetener. And we'll talk about sweetener in a minute. But the secret is that pumpkin, oh, nut butter, I forgot to say. So the main structure of the food is nut butter and pumpkin flavored mm. with chocolates. And and the nut butter and pumpkin combine as it, it's just this magic. You don't need oil. You don't need flour. You would think that it was full of oil and flour, but it's a vegetable and nut butter. So high in protein, healthy fats, beyond delicious. Wow. Trust me. Hmm. And I talk a lot with people about sweeteners because so many folks have this concept of artificial sweetening as being a horrible thing. Mm. It's not. I use monk fruit and monk, sometimes the monk fruit is mis- mixed with uh, erythritol, terrible name, good sweetener. And these things have no calories, have no effect on your blood sugar. Uh, if you use chicory root, which is another wonderful one, it actually has beneficial effects. Um, there, there are a number of really great sugar substitutes on the market just the last 10, 15 years that you all of a sudden you can bake cakes, pies, and my book is full of them. Yummy thing. But but that's just part of the deal. I mean, I love sweets and I like I like dessert three times a day or two times a day <laughs> with every meal. But I can have it. Yeah. I can have it. It's good food. It's whole food, real food, plant-based food. Amazing just happens to be dessert so and the book has a lot of recipes for kind of ordinary things that ordinary folks cook a lot uh it's more american than totally typical australian but things like macaroni and cheese Mm -hmm. who doesn't love it well i'll tell you how to make it and it's absolutely wonderful and you make it with cream cauliflower Mm. instead yeah so good Mm. And for you. So, and then people say, well, isn't it kind of expensive to eat? No, it's not. And if you will recall, when the pandemic first was in the news and the shelves were empty and, oh my gosh, we get, you better, you know, go to the store and grab stuff. Believe me, in the produce aisle, there was no panic. Mm. I was often alone <laughs> by the celery. There was nobody in there grabbing handfuls of arugula Mm. so that they would. um, And a lot of us grow it ourselves. In my case, I have raised beds right in front of my house. Mm. And it doesn't take a lot of space. You can do it in pots. And it's virtually free Mm. that way. I mean, you buy some seeds or you buy some starts and then you've got all these beautiful things to eat. Also, where I live, we're lucky we have blackberries wild everywhere. That is without a doubt, and there's tons of science behind it, one of the best possible things you can put in your body, blackberries. Wow, yeah. And then just go pick them mm. and then put them in your freezer. So do not whine to me about how expensive good food is. I mean, and certainly, and I'm being snarky, but you know, if you live in a, in a city where you're in a sort of food desert and there's just, yeah, it is a problem, but it's a problem that's increasingly being solved with delivery services and, and you know, people are taking parks and making little growing mm. spaces out of communal gardens. And that is an ethical approach mm. to eating because one of the things that we need to do ethically is to close the factory farms, which the only way you're going to close the factory farms that are abusing animals and putting all the pollutants out in the rivers and the ocean, don't buy it. Mm, exactly. And then the people who are raising those foods realize that the market is shrinking. Problem solved. Mm. So it's up to you and me, up to us with our grocery money to just stop supplying the the shareholder value 
to the people who are abusing the animals, to the people who are in those buildings making craveable things, just don't buy it. Mm. End of problem. And that's that's the whole point of, um, you know, this show, Lynn, is to have these conversations that actually help us make that change and actually make decisions based on our values. So if our values are that we actually want to care about the world and make a difference and make a change, we can make that change with how we spend our money and how we eat. Every meal you eat, everything that you serve your kids, everything that you serve your friends is an expression of who you are on the earth mm. in 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 a very spiritual way, because mm-hmm. food, community, I mean, what is it in our lives that is more expressive of our family, our friends, the love that we have for each other? Absolutely. You know, that through all of time, it's been sharing food. And so I, I hope everyone will take it to heart and realize how much power there is, not only in your own health, mm. but the health of the planet and your community, all of it is something that you can maybe not do by yourself, but you can definitely make a difference as just one person. Exactly. Exactly right. Now, Lynn, if people want to find out more about you and, and get a hold of your book, where can they go? LynnBowman.com. <laughs> I hope that's easy enough. Nice and easy. And, but just be sure to spell my name right because it's L Y. N N E B O W M A N dot com. And I encourage you to sign up there. I have a little Lynn's list on the front page. And if you put your email there, you'll be on my list and I will send you, I'll send you the brownie recipe free right away. And I will send you the uh, information about sweeteners to get you going. Mm. Cause right now I want you to quit sugar. I mean, tonight, today, I want you to quit sugar. But I'll tell you how free if you will sign up on the website. I'll get you that. And then I send out recipes, you know, not every day, but uh, not even every week. Um, but I do when I come up with something that I think is fantastic, I'll just share that with you. And I love hearing from people and getting pictures of what you've done. Mm. Um, people ask me about the photos in the book. And I've, I've got one here. Brownies for breakfast, right here. But it's very visual. Mm. And, um, look at there's pumpkin. <laughs> yeah, nice. And people ask me about how I got these photographs, and I want you to know that I took them with my iPhone, wow. just like you took your pictures for Instagram. And the reason I did that was because I wanted you to be able to get exactly what I get when I cook. I didn't have people in here foofing up the food and painting it with oil and making it up. No, I just snapped pictures of what I was cooking with my iPhone. And you can do the same and send it to me. Mm. And I would love that. I live for that stuff. I'll have to send you some. (laughs) You're on. Now, Lynn, you know, I hope you keep writing recipes and sharing your wisdom uh, because everybody needs a granny like you. Um, in in all your years, if you were to share a bite of wisdom for us all, what would it be? Eat joyfully. Mm. Simple as that. Simple as that. Mm. I love it's it. Good for your head, your spirit, your friends, your kids. Love and it. You know, it can be simple. It doesn't have to be poofy or fancy. But I, I will always appreciate my food. Uh, I've been without as many as uh, many of you have. And um, if you can eat joyfully, you got a good life. Mm. I think. Mm. Love it. I'm going to ask you the last big question, and it's probably going to be a very similar answer to the question I just asked you. But... What's the change you'd like to see in the world and how can we bring it to life? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, you already know I want you to eat whole food, plant-based food, real food. I want that because that is going to be a huge change. Uh, and I would love that for the whole world because I have an idea that if certain men 
at a certain point in their lives had been loved with good whole food, they wouldn't be trying to blow the freaking planet up now, would mm. they? Um, peace. Mm. That's what we want is peace for everyone. And, um, you know, there's no need for us to fight over food resources. There's enough. Mm. We have more than enough if we would just eat the way ethically, the way we've been talking about. There's more than enough. So eat joyfully and peacefully. How's that? Mm. Lena, I reckon I could talk to you all day, and I reckon one day we will. Um, I hope we do more. Yeah, and I can't believe you're going to be in L.A. Yeah. and be partying together. <laughs> you have to come up. Um, but, look, I can't thank you enough for being a part of the ethical evolution. I have loved every single minute. Me too. Thanks for listening to the Ethical Evolution Podcast. If you're ready to be the change and would love to work with me on finding your voice through spiritual coaching or creating your own podcast with impact, visit ethicalchangeagency.com. Welcome to Ringside with Ray and Prince. My name is Ray Leonard Jr. Oh, that's my name is Prince Daniels Jr. Daniels again with a big hole. Touchdown! On this show, we come to humanize athletes, entertainers, business executives. We're going to see what makes them tick. Tuesdays, 10 a.m. Pacific time on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, and wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you there. Peace and power. Electric acid. Welcome to the Reverie Channel, where entertainment knows no bounds. Live concerts, on-demand music, documentaries, and short films, all in stunning HD. Now on Roku TV, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire, immerse yourself from home. And on Android and iOS for those on the move. Support creators with crowdfunding donations. Fuel their creativity. Join us in shaping entertainment's future. The Reverie Channel, where every view, every donation matters. Electric Acid.